this is strange others somehow coming in, right? This is, you're producing the citizen, so the state can give to that institution. So for many people, then when they graduated from the, you know, you graduated from a university in the so-called third world, they, this European university had the prestige. And if you access, you also have, you don't have to pay, you know, in many cases you don't pay tuition, and so on. So it seemed like financially viable, and also it has the prestige. And also, once you're in your university, they tell you that the best hopes that you have to have a job in this university is if you go out and you edu educate in that university. So everything is telling you, go the F away. And everything is telling you. So it's, I would say that the first thing is that it's completely in the sense normal. Everything is telling you that. And actually, it, it's also in the interest of those universities to house some of these intellectuals, because that means that you can cultivate them in-house. So when they go back, they can produce what is inside. And they try to then apply the economical and political theories of the center to the periphery. They come, you know, already they go to Europe and they understand, oh, nihilism is a fundamental problem, or whatever it is, right? So then you go back to your place talking about European, you know, European. Everything, all the problematics that you learn there, you transpose them here, and that's what you educate. And if they don't get it, it's because, you know, they are. Uh, Ignorant, you know, they have not gone through. The other day at UNISA was a faculty member who was saying that you know one of his professors when he was a student said you know had gone to Iran and had studied I don't know uh, not Shakespeare but more contemporary poets and then when he came back he was teaching it to to the students and they said well you know uh, what do you think what do you, what do you think and so on and then at the end he said well of course you cannot completely understand it because you have never been in London. So that's the function. So there is a, is a, everyone's interest from the colonial state or the dependent new colonial state in the periphery to the center that, that happens in that way. Now, after the, uh, when they, the, the US university began to take sort of the lead in terms of the global production of, of, of knowledge and publications and so on. Then they began to give, they, they were not going to be for free, but they then had fellowships and so on. So you could still come from the third world. And actually, you could go to an education in the US, for example, with uh, much less debt at the end than if you, if you work at your, in, your, in, your, in your colonial institution, you have to work, you will be there, it will take you forever to finish. Uh, you can never completely you know, focus on it. And besides also, the uh, Western universities, which is basically all of these universities in the colonies, they tend to be uh, more, in Spanish we say, más papista que papa, more popis than the Pope. They tend to be, you know, because they are, have that difference with the center. You know, if in the center they require this for you to finish, in the colonies they would require that for you to finish. Right? So usually, even a master's thesis at the University of Puerto Rico, I, I put my money on the table that if we go to the archives, many of the master theses will be more substantial, developed, and longer than doctoral theses in the United States today, MA theses, and that still happens. So the expectation when you enter is, you enter into the master, okay, you are here for a decade. But for a decade, you know, you have to cover all of this, you have to learn all of this, and it's very, I mean, in some cases, it's like people wanting to delay you, particularly if you are a person of color. They take it as a strategy to delay your, your de obtaining your degree. But sometimes, they are so, again, the cruises of them, you're so committed with them, you have to go through all of this. And again, you obtain a marvelous, of like, incredible education, out of with an MA, you get more than a PhD. But of course, in terms of social mobility, your authority, all of that is undermined in the process. So, I mean, we, we can go on and on and on, but there's no major reason in that way, from, even from, <laughs> you know, from a typical point of view, to remain necessarily there. Unless you have developed a particular point of critical point of view and so on and so forth, and that's the best place to do it. But you see, many times, the Western University in the colony is not the, it's not the place that is going to tolerate dissent. So, for example, in, I, I did philosophy at the University of Puerto Rico. Yes. And you all, oh, what's the University of Puerto Rico? So you study Latin American philosophy or Caribbean philosophy. <laughs> Nothing like that would ever be allowed by my professors to be taught there. Other than, actually, 
There was a class I remember Mesoamerican time. From, you know, the only class philosophy was uh, to do with Latin America. Only class that I can remember. And you know who taught it? The one German professor in the faculty. <laughs> That's it. And because he was also there, not because he was going to teach that, but he could, because he was going to teach German philosophy. It's only that out of your repertoire you develop that and you teach it. So there is not necessarily the space in the university that's, you know, to develop that kind of critical thinking. So even in the, in the, in the colonies, the kind of the colonial thinking and so on, the university have not been, for the most part, the places where that knowledge is produced. Is communities, is the mobilizations, is in this, in that. Now, gradually, where sort of activists are entering the academy, you know, you do a program, you cultivate, you do that, but still it's very minimal. Now, in the US, let me finish with this, uh, but in the US, this has to do with the dynamic of space that I was mentioning before. You know, North and South. Well, when I tell you that, you know, I was part, I, I was teaching, and I am teaching, but right now, I'm teaching in this place that was open by you know, student strike, Puerto Rican students, it was Puerto Rican studies, and the, you know, as part of their work, knowledge, and, and, and so on. That space in the north is more southern than many spaces in the academy in the so-called south. So being in an anthropology department, or a sociology department, or a Spanish department, or an English department, in any of the universities in the south could be much more alienating colonizing, repressive, that being in the US, in one of these universities, in a space that was opened up by an insurgency of people who actually are connected to the South or from the South. And so I had the fortune of being able to my career find it there. Right. Maybe that, you know, then to the extent that you can begin to, those were cracks in the in the system of knowledge when you created the black studies and you created these various areas. It was not meant only to be that, but that was part of it. So the idea is that once you occupy that, how do you continue contributing to increasing, increasing the class? Now, you have to do it in, inside the classroom, but I think that, and I'm sure that you would agree, because the coloniality is about the connections between the inside the university and outside the university and activism and art and so on. So I think even the pedagogy push you to be you know, and it's about, again, the time, the time and the space of learning and teaching is already different from the, from the tradition. So the question is how can you create new spaces and temporalities through the classroom or beyond the classroom, how to break the walls between communities and, and inside. Now, the, the question about, the larger question, uh, and I was not exactly sure how to, to, to grapple with the issue, the, the Guptas and what happened in, in, South, in South Africa. Maybe, maybe I'm thinking, um, I mean, this is, in a way goes beyond the scope. You know, I'm already presenting some tentative ideas, and I don't want to go too crazy in that direction. So I would say that, that you also, if we can put it there, you know, the issue as for all of us to think about because you are, you're going in an area that is very important, but it's going beyond my limited, ex, mi, limited and minimal expertise. So I would like to know also how you are addressing these issues about also how whites in the, in the, the country relate to, to these changes. Um, I have some notions, but again, they are even more at a basic level than anything that I have presented. So I have a listen to that. I suppose one way of answering the question is that Gupta, uh, the Oppenheimers are Gupta plus time. Uh, another round of questions, perhaps? Eric? Um, one, you, you just touched on one thing that I was going to ask, uh, which is about what happened to all of the ethnic studies, which is one of the modes of both cracking but also containment. Of these things, where all of the, you know, all of the uh, academics of color were kind of shunted into these zones where they could then be hired and they could be contained, and you could make sure that most of the liberal, most of the, 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 the epistemic structure of the liberal academy overall was maintained more or less as it was. But you could also use it to draw in students of color, uh, in order to demonstrate that you were diversifying to the extent where 
you know, now if you go, people will, will tell you with a great sense of triumph that if you go to Berkeley, well, 70% of the students are not white. If you go to Stanford, 50% of the students are not white. So you see, it's uh, nothing like what it appears to be, but you make sure that the most difficult ones are uh, studying with professors who kind of look like them and think like that, but that's fine because you are, you've trained them into the aspiration to be part of the similar location in the academy where they go. So, that's, so that would be one you know, very cynical way of looking at it. Of course, the reverse is that it's not as though those have not profoundly kind of shaken things up because they have. They have been spaces that open up these sorts of possibilities. But as you map that onto here and what you've seen here, it's different, of course, because there, they're sort of referred to as, well, those are, those are minorities and so on. You still have the idea that you have the majority that needs to be attended to, whereas here you have the odd circumstance that you have the academy that still looks like the minority in terms of what's taught, who teaches, uh, and so on. So you get that dissonance. I'm interested in your reflections on that. That's the first question. The second has to do with um, how it is that in, in the US, many students cut their political teeth as they became um, graduate students. And on the one hand, they were enrolled as teaching assistants, often paid very poorly, and struggled to organize as workers. And that formed an alliance with unionized workers on campus who were the cleaners and so on. So you have that, that kind of thing, which you don't, again, you don't see that uh, here. Uh, and then, um, what was the other point about uh, workers? Then, of course, the other thing is that we're beginning to reflect here on how uh, we don't yet have the casualization of, uh, of academic work uh, to nearly the extent that you now see in, especially in North America, uh, to some extent in, uh, in, in Europe. But, uh, but you, don't, you, don't, you don't yet here have a process where students who finish a PhD know that they have a very remote chance of ever getting a fully paid place, and instead it's much more likely that they'll, up, that they'll be working at subsistence wages at multiple jobs, teaching here, teaching there, and so on. So the realization of the full vision of the neoliberal academy there <laughs> It's starting to look like, well, it might be our future here, but we're still at some remove from it. And uh, so again, I'm wondering what, what warnings or what insights would you have from the, the directions that that is taking and the implications of the politics that are kind of boiling here uh, for, for South Africa? Um, <clears throat> I spoke about decolonization as a process, and we don't exactly know we well, we can't know exactly where it's going. Um, my question is about uh, sustaining the process. And what, what are those resources um, that may have sustained? If you go, if we go back to the 70s and 80s, uh, black consciousness movement that basically died um, at, at, uh, for particular reasons, and rising again now um, in a particular um, social historical space, um, what, what could make it more sustainable at, at this stage? Um, like, uh, particularly in the light of, of the way the new liberal university tries to capture the space <coughs> and tries to colonize uh, this, exactly this energy again. And, and claim actually credit for what the students have been doing. Uh, this at the back there. Yes, please. So I have, thank you very much. I have one comment and then two questions. Um, my first comment goes to the issue around debt. And I'm not sure whether you are aware, but one of the main solutions put forward now is that um, the VC and the team are in conversation with the banks around developing payment plans for students. And again, in a very pragmatic response that you would highlighted. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see whether the students will take the bait. Because I think that there are so many divisions, again, I think within the Peace Must Fall movement. And so I, I think that's just going to be very interesting to see what happens there. Because there hasn't been historically here um, the, you know, that, that trap of, of getting into debt. So that, that's my second question, or I would ask you to comment, is that I wonder whether you see any links between the Occupy movement um, and the Peace Must Fall, as well as Black Lives Matter, you know, which is taking hold around university campuses in, in North America and in the Quebec 
students who have also been on strike for you know a very long time around around fees. And so I, I, I guess my question is, do you see this you know a kind of globalization in some way um, from your perspective? And then my last comment is around values and around principles. And I, I think you you the way that you have characterized the um, the liberal value system of the intellectuals and academics. I think that's that's very true, um, and the kind of cruise Trump danger. And yet, I I also I'm, I'm I'm you know there's always been a critique or a recent critique that the left lacks values and principles, and that in fact it could benefit in some way from articulating. You know, are there core principles, or you know, and so in a way, if if we under if you know that return to values in, in a way, you know, is there room for that within within the left, and I guess within this sort of uh, you know new canon, or I, I wonder how you see that 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 happening. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I understood you uh, correctly about actually, you know, uh, whiteness is not necessarily being about, you know, uh, you being a white person in the sense of having long hair, white skin color and all that, but, you know, as a set of, uh, like, as a set of certain principles and values that, like, when you said you, you know, you, you can come to South Africa and become an ordinary white, uh, white person and you, know, you lose this whiteness when you go to America because now the the, the, you know, the, the the dynamics of, of what constitutes whiteness, you know, changes from what constitutes whiteness in in uh, South Africa. You know, uh, like I mean, uh, you know, uh, for more like uh, you know uh, that it is not necessarily you know uh, about you as an individual, but where are you located within uh, uh, a particular place and time? Maybe you come to South Africa. In, you have this prestige of being a professor, and then you know, uh, coming from uh, a different continent, having uh, a certain skin color that is not necessarily, you know, how we would appear to, to whiteness, and then you assume uh, uh, that position of whiteness because of how whiteness is presumed in South Africa. And you go back to to America, where you know, uh, America is stretches from the north up to the south, and then. There's a whole different dynamics of what Americans are, and then there are white Americans, and there are different types of Americans. So now, when you go there, you lose this, this you know, the, the the status of being white, and then also if that if whiteness is, you know, is a set of principles and values and norms and status, so how does it then, you know, uh, like currently in South Africa? We, as black people, we still in, you know, very, in a very similar position during the apartheid you know, era and colonial era. And yet there is less revolution you know, against the system. So, uh, so now that, uh, for me, you know, if, if, if whiteness becomes a set of principles, it means that whiteness in South Africa is still in governance. But then only if, you know, uh, you know, the, the physical you know, uh, 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 you know, subject has, you know, is the one governing you know, uh, the country through whiteness. And yet now, because of we're not aware that actually we still govern, we're still being governed by whiteness, we don't necessarily get to revolt against the system. You know, when you look at townships, townships were actually a colonial creation of labor hubs for the city. And it will continue with the same system to continue to create more and more and more townships. And then there is this idea that you know, that township is where you find humanity. But then, you, is, is humanity where you wake up in the morning and see a drainage system passing through your yard, and you see uh, garbage being thrown in front of your eye, or in front of your heart, or all over the place? Is humanity where you, are, you live in a one room shed? You know, uh, where even, you know, your, your, your basic, you know, uh, human needs are compromised. You can't even engage in sexual activities because the children are also in the same space. And then, that, most that those intimate, you know, uh, you know, uh, activities are even compromised, and then 
and then we come and say, I'm proud to come from this space, because this space is where humanity is. You know, so how, how does you know, neoliberalism and liberalism actually cultivate that culture of us thinking that being in a township is actually a space where it is most human? You know, and when you bring uh, decolonization into this space, how can it, you know, decolonization work in terms of decolonizing the space which is called the suburb, decolonizing the space which is called the township? You know, uh, because I feel we still step in a colonial you know, creation of our spaces when we continue to create more and more townships and more and more suburbs, you know, uh, conforming to these uh, divisions of, you know, uh, of class and society. You know, uh, yeah, I think yeah. <coughs> yes, I have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, is there, uh, yeah, we, we take uh, two more questions and then we have to wind up. Yes, there's one there and one at the back, yes. Please. Uh, okay, I know that it wasn't the focus of your, of your discussion, but then for the mere fact that you mentioned it, I have to ask the question. Um, with, 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 with the Puerto Rican movement, you said that it lasted for, what, two years? So, like, my question then is, uh, because movements in nature are not necessarily sustainable, how did that movement actually manage to last for that long? Yes, um, I'm Tepo Muro from UJ. Um, I've heard everything you've said, but uh, I'd like to hear what is a decolonized university in Africa at the end? What will it look like? What will it take? Thank you. Yes. Uh, I think we'll, uh, I'm sorry to have to call an end to all questions because we have to vacate this space. So I'll leave it to Nelson to answer these. And then tomorrow again at 10 o'clock at the Center for Indian Studies in Africa, which is across the road from the Senate House, uh, we'll have another set of discussions and hopefully we can bring back some of the questions that this lecture has raised. Um, let me see where we are. Let me explain this. Yeah. With, with regards to the ethnic studies in the US, I mean, all of these, it has, it has to do also with the question of sustainability or the question of sustainability, I think. Because, I mean, I think that these is, is struggles um, also have to do with the Puerto Rico question of Puerto Rico, right? There are, uh, it also has to do with the question about um, Occupy and Black Lives Matter and, and so on. And um, that we see it now when, you know, when, when, the, when the system seems to produce certain excesses, <laughs> you know, when it really gets excessive, it wakes up revolt. Right? In Latin America, when, when even the water is being privatized, you know, when even the water, you know, somebody's going down that country, right? Because communities, right? they have another kind of, particularly if you're an indigenous community and the water is not only about drinking, right? It's territory, it's land, it's everything's life, right? and you're privatizing that. So what we have seen, in, I think, in the, possibly, I don't know, in the last, since the 1990s, possibly, which explains the emergence of the Zapatistas in 1984 and so on, but it has been an, well, and it's not by accident, it's the post-Cold War moment, <laughs> post-Cold War moment getting more and more um, excessive in, in that regard. Right? When liberalism easily gives path to, uh, this way to, to neoliberalism in, in a very strong way. And the two of them begin the dialectic. So if before the dialectic was supposed to be between the left and the, and the, and the right, or the left and center, you know, or, or liberalism and, and Marxism, since the so-called, you know, the end of the Cold War, seems to be dramatically more between liberalism and, and neoliberalism, and intra, in, intra. So as that dialectic, of course, this is, is, is very broad, right? I, I'm sure that there are many things that one can say about, about that. But in that dialectic, then, when, you know, the, again, before there was this notion that there could be a different world. There could be a different world. Now it's like, generally speaking, no, there cannot be. 
So everything that is turned more and more into the logic of liberalism, then new liberalism, and, they, and then everything is about the competition of those two. But you see, as they go along, they are producing more and more concentration of capital in fewer people, and more devastation, misery, poverty in largest amount of the population. With more, uh, you even as time goes by, they have less and less and less, not even more. So it's creating this brutal situation in the sense. And I think that these movements, and then racism continues, you know, on <coughs> top, because of course neither liberalism nor neoliberalism have the tools to address that situation. Actually, they paralyze it and they could build on that. Uh, I mean, it's cheap labor at the end, right? You have large sectors of the population automatically are cheap labor. And women earning roads, you have all these differences, you build on them. So I think that it is. In, in that respect, what we're seeing is not, you know, should not cause surprise, right? That we're seeing all of these, these defiances, these modes of defiances. Now the question is, once it gets to a point where you find a movement and the movement does something, then how do you sustain, how do you sustain that? How, how do you continue that? And um, first off, many of these, um, uh, many of these sort of protests against this dialectic, intra-Western modern dialectic between liberalism and li neoliberalism, you know, Marxism, that other ideology still keeps, you know, coming back. You saw in Ve Venezuela, for example, right, uh, a sort of, sort of a, a socialism for the first for the 21st century, all of it. So it's still there. So sometimes with more or less awareness of the questions of racial difference and colonialism. Because when you're coming from that tradition, you're looking at the question of you know, the worker and certain kind of economic disparities. So I think that sometimes, the, I mean, for, for me, I think that those tools sometimes prove limited, but still, in, if, in a context where you have liberalism and, and neoliberalism reigning and going rampant, that can actually put open space for different kinds of interventions, for other actors to enter the scene. Uh, so that's good. So what's happened is that, at least in, in some of the places, the movements can actually, um, a number of them have actually become, if not they were not official political movement, they have gone into the election, they have gone through the democratic process, and they have won the election and got power in the state. Happened in a number of Latin American countries. In other places, like the Zapatistas, they say, we don't want to take the state. You know, we don't, you don't want to stake, we don't want to, 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 to do that. So what do you do and how do you sustain the struggle? Right? And the Zapatistas created autonomous communities. Right? And they got some degree of autonomy and they're able to subsist. They have been subsisting all that way. That's, that's a level of subsistence right there. Right. They are living, they're cultivating, they are changing between them, they are doing their own schools. They are, that's a level of, that's why that project is continuously relevant, I think. Right? They do the schools, they open it, they give schools. To, to other people who want to know more about that. In a way, what would the, the colonized university be? Which, by the way, is, I mean, I've been in other talks where I, that has been the focus. I still, the question is, I, I still resist the, the, the question, not because I don't have so many ideas to say, I still resist it because of this. Because in some way, some of the steps are so simple, like for instance, not criminalizing the students to begin with. Only taking them as viable interlocutors, right there. It's not about you know giving you the recipe of how what the Department of Anthropology will look like in the whether we will have one or not. I mean we could hypothesize, but the colonization itself is about introducing you know, other optics, other interlocutors, other ways, and then commit with the change. And what I see the questions is that more often than not, I think many people who ask it again is that you know you're waiting for. You're waiting for Godot to present itself in an image, and then, if anything. But you know, the appearance of Godot itself will not move you, will not move anyone. Because it will be incomplete, it will be imperfect, you find a reason to reject it, and so on. If you don't find compelling enough, taking these subjects as interlocutors, looking at what they are doing, taking their challenges seriously, talk with them to see, you want to know what a decolonized university is? Talk with the students themselves, call them in dialogue, figure out ways of empowering them, coming together, right? You do it in that, in that way. So in a way, it's simple and extremely difficult at the same time, right? But it should not be anything about, now give me the new map, right? Or the new, the new model. 
because it's there. It's how do we, you know, how do you decolonize your expertise? How do you decolonize that entrenched conservatism and romanticization of the university and your liberalism, right? So a lot of it has to do with that, how, how scholars themselves. And actually, I'm coming back to the issue of sustainability. Uh, it's related with this. Because I think that in the current situation, for example, one, the, the question is, once you have a movement, how do you translate that movement into a series of, of spaces that are created and institutionally supported in some way? Now, in the institutionalization of any space, of any decolonial space, within a colonial structure, will already be a compromise a space that can work for multiple things. It's the space of ambiguity, it's the space that it will be a space of continuous struggle. And when you are calling for it, you're not saying because finally we made it. You're saying because we at least open now a minimal space where we can subsist here. But you know, when you do this, you need to go on. And this is Fanon. Is, I think, that's why Fanon so, continues to be so powerful for, for me. When you read the first line in Black Skin White Mask is, the revolution will not happen, the explosion will not happen today. It is too soon or too late. So even you are doing the temporality, it's too soon or too late. The temporality is not, your action is not depending on actually if the completion of a fully decolonized struggle. When you are now engaging, intervening, doing something, it's not because you think that certainly the revolution will happen. If not, why do No, it, it may not even happen. And yet I cannot conceive of living my life, my existence, in other way than struggling and expanding the space for that to happen. So that's your commitment. Now, so hopefully you open up spaces that can remain even after, let's say, you know, even after those moments of revolt and mobilization. Now, for that, the best that that can happen is, well, you know, if there is no other way to do it, then you try, you create strategies to s sort of come to a settlement that will include some kind of spaces. But, you know, it should, I don't think it should be, again, it should not be like that. When I talked before about you know, the history of the university and so on, I was saying that there are some principles, in terms of values, if you will, inside the university, that if the university took them seriously, it will already be doing much more than what it is doing now. So I think part of the problem is that those values either are, many of them are really rhetoric, or are not even taken seriously at all in that place. And actually, some of those values, I think, you find them more extraordinarily present in the student movement themselves, in the relation of comradeship that begin to, and in the kind of, the approach that they have towards their own texts and their own readings, I think. So that I don't think that when you actually engage with the students is the absence of, of, of values or any appreciation of, I think that already there, and the, 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 the second part of my talk, which was about, you know, the time of love, the temporal, you know, love in temporality, love in speciality, it's all about, there is an implicit, also deep ethical core non-liberal values, right? it's not about tolerance, it's about, the it's about this commitment now in the present for the time of transformation, even if the revolution will not happen. So it's a huge commitment, I mean, how do you commit with something without you being maybe the main beneficiary and without it being necessarily completely successful? So that speaks to a kind of valuation and view of yourself and time and life and institutions that way, I think, we, we, beyond the scope of the standard liberalism. So it is not lacking, if it's actually posing different kind of, of values, I think. But to go to, to, to a more concrete thing, and I'm just in two minutes. I think that in South Africa, so again, the university has, I think, insight. It can, you can find ways to say, you should be responding different as an institution. You should not be delimiting the university, even the modern Western university. It should not. Even internally, I think you can make your argument, you should not be delimited, maybe with liberalism, but in this dialectic, this little dialectic of liberalism and neoliberalism, if your values are so profound, if your knowledge is so really excellent, you should be able to break with that. And the students are there to help you break with that. So the students are, in that way, the movement is a resource. So it should be like that. Right? Now, the resistance will be there. So I think that either you strategize to find some kind of settlement so that you create some spaces, however ambiguous they are, to be able to continue the struggle. Not to simply declare victory. Then if you declare victory tomorrow, those spaces will be not ambivalent, they will completely part of the problem. So you have to keep the struggle with them. Now, in the current moment, I think that the position of 
not only black faculty, but let me look at black faculty, focus on black faculty.